Father, we are grateful that we get to honor you today, the ultimate Father. Father, you're well aware that there are many that are uh, in difficult times. Uh, they don't really know about you. They might not have the example of an earthly father. There may be a lot of pain, hurt, loneliness. Father, I pray that your words will come through me today that will give people hope that there is a Father, that He's real, that He's always been around, and that He created each one of us for fellowship with Him. So, Father, I thank you for this opportunity that healing can manifest, restoration will overtake whatever spiritual darkness has people in disarray and discomfort. And I thank you, Father God, as the example for us all to follow as a father. We come to you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, maybe this day, you know, Father's Day, maybe we're not quite as sentimental as we are for Mother's Day, and there's probably a little bit of truth to that. Um, because fathers, dads usually aren't as sensitive to the needs of their children and, you know, mothers are a little bit better at that. So, I wanted to tell you the story. Have you heard the story of the, the couple? They had a baby and the father was, you know, very excited, this child, and he's at the hospital and he goes down to the maternity ward as his wife's recovering on the bed and she kind of notices he's gone and she knew he was there and so she gets out of the bed and starts to saunter down to the to the maternity ward where she sees him looking through the glass to see their baby she kind of saunters up to him and smiles and puts her hand through his and she goes honey what are you thinking and he goes you know honey I just haven't been able to figure out how they've been able to make that crib for $89.95. Now, have you heard the story of the man who had triplets, three boys? And these boys were good boys. They'd always hang out together. They played well together. They were normal boys. Well, one day the neighbor was kind of like wondering how the dad could tell them apart, because he couldn't, and he went up to the father and he goes, Hey, how are you able to tell your boys apart? For instance, like, what do you do when one of them, you know, needs to be disciplined? And the father goes, oh, that's super easy. All I do is send all three of them to bed without supper. And then the next morning, the one with the black eye is the one I need to discipline. <laughs> There's something else I heard at one point. This father and his teenage son were in a discussion. All of a sudden you can hear the father say, no son, you can't have the family car tonight. But feel free to use that lawnmower anytime you want. <laughs> now someone noticed that the word father appears in the dictionary just before the word fatigued and just after the word fathead. <laughs> so to all us fatigued fathead fathers, happy Father's Day. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Now, something I've learned along the way here is that children kind of speak a different language than us parents, especially us fathers. Parents frequently make the mistake that they speak the same language as their children. Now, this kind of misunderstanding is more common than I think we realize. I'm referring to the fact that the British and the Americans speak English. We, my, my family knows this because we, uh, 20 years ago, we moved to England. We lived in London for three years. So I can attest to this that there's a lot of misunderstandings between the British and the Americans over the same word. For instance, when an American says bonnet, we're referring to a hat. When a Brit says bonnet, they're referring to a hood of a car. <laughs> now, I think that very same thing is right here when we're talking with our children. It seems as though we're all speaking English, but upon closer inspection, it becomes crystal clear that children and par parents speak 
an entirely different dialect a lot of times. Here are just a few examples, some key phrases about the translations and the errors I'm talking about. If a kid, if your child says, I cannot finish my meal, that usually means they really don't like the meal, but they're trying to tell you that they've ate enough so that they can get dessert. Right? Now, if a child says, I can't finish my dessert, that means they're sick. Okay? If, if, um, if they say something like, um, I didn't do it, that means it's not been conclusively proven that they did it. Okay? If they say something like, Johnny Jones is a no good, rotten liar, expect a call from Johnny Jones's mom. Right? If the, if the child says, Dad, can I have a dog? That actually means, Dad, can I have a dog? But if they say, Dad, can I have a boa constrictor? constrictor that means they're, tic- they're thinking of some kind of animal that they know you're going to say no to so that they have a better chance of getting the dog. Now, I think a lot of you can testify to what I just said, um, you know, talking to your children or, you know, grandchildren, that they speak a different language. And it's one of the reasons that it's a daunting task us parents have, us fathers have, of raising children. Now, there are other reasons, of course, but I wanted to address some of the things that we can do to prepare ourselves to be better parents, to be better grandparents, to be better fathers, to be better grandfathers. Now, there's this wonderful, very well-known scripture, Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, you know, I, there's never a, a debate, I think, about how we all will love our children, love our grandchildren, treat them well, but the inevitable is that at times, they're going to, they're gonna, like, turn from us. Sometimes they journey on roads that we do not understand or down a path we just clearly do not approve of. But in the end, if our hearts are open, if the foundation is well laid, we will see them return to us just like the Luke chapter 15 prodigal son. We talked about that a little this morning in the, in the worship room. That famous story Jesus shared about the wayward younger son and how the father left the door open and the son returned. I just think it's really critical that we hear this today. As long as we keep the door open, there's a very good chance that the child will return. I think part of the problem we have as parents is not that we have difficult children or even that they speak a different language than we do at times, Even though those are true, I'm convinced that more and more, the bigger part of the problem is that we as parents often do not know the way our children should go. We as parents don't really know what's right. And more importantly, even if we kind of know the way, we often fail to live the way that shows them the way. In other words, we didn't know what to do when we were kids, and therefore, we use our experience as children as the examples to use on our kids, but we don't tell them the right way to go, or we don't witness the right way to go. And that cycle repeats itself generation after generation. And so, what our culture shows us is that our children become angry, they become distant, they become alienated from us, and from God. So, big question. What's the answer? How, how, does this, how does this thing change? Dads, first and foremost, for those watching online, dads, or if you see this later, dads, we must actually live godly lives. <laughs> we must keep promises concerning our relationships to God. If we skip the relationship with God and they're still at the people, that is showing the child that they don't need a relationship with the Father in heaven. We must keep our relationships with people and our families and and our relationships with all people that we make promises to. We must be mature and maturing in the faith 
and be the spiritual head of the family as God has called us to be. We as men must com commit ourselves to building strong biblical marriages. Support the mission of Christ with our time, our talent, our treasure, our testimony, our prayers. As men of Christ, we must devote ourselves to demonstrating the love of Christ in our community. As men of Christ, we are to live moral and virtuous lives based on scriptural principles. Not something you see on the TV. Not something you've learned in science class unless it aligns with the Bible. The result will only be the renewal of our own lives as men. But see, if that happens with us, it'll bring the renewal of our lives and our families to our churches, to our community, and ultimately to our world. In other words, our relationship with God is so important because that is what sets the stage for other successful relationships. Or another way I like to say this, and I've said this a lot the last year, so many of you have heard it, but it's worth saying again. Hard times create strong men. Hard times. You don't get to be a strong man unless you're going through some stuff. If you shelter yourself from strong, or if, if you, as a parent, shelter your children from tough things, they will not be able to operate on their own. They're going to keep running back to you and need you to resolve everything, regardless of how old they are. So, hard times create strong men. Strong men, then, create good times. Good times create weak men. And weak men create hard times. I want us to follow along as we read from Paul's first letter to Timothy expressing his prayer for Christian men in a kind of a graphic picture. It's 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. Paul's talking to Timothy and he says, Therefore, I want the men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger, or disputing. So this text here, this scripture is calling for men with an open commitment to living the reality of the very presence of the living God. This phrase that he uses here, lift up holy hands without anger or disputing. That is simply saying it's we are to be seeking a guy who has discovered an audience and a confidence in his relationship with the Lord. This is a man like, this is a guy who doesn't come strutting into God's presence, but one who comes with holy hands, hands that have something happened, that have had something happen to them. These hands have been transformed. This is a man who comes to the Lord with an openness and a recognition, knowing that he is received and accepted by the Father, the Almighty God in heaven. Paul is saying, I wish men were more like this, men of faith, and men of self-control, men who would no, no doubt and would not be possessed by anger. They're not going to doubt things, and they're not going to let anger run them. It's a biblical call to a real relationship, to a friendship with God, to be able to call on God for everything. It's a call for intimate relationship, for intimate friendship. There's something I heard, it's about 20 years ago now, and I heard it from a, from a pretty well-known minister. He's almost 90 now. His name's Jack Hayford. And I instituted this into my life and how I minister at times when I get one-on-one -on -one with guys. Jack Hayford said it like this. He said, it's as if God drank coffee and you'd feel comfortable coming to him, and you'd pour him a cup of coffee, and then, as you sat there, you'd pour out your heart. Now, just imagine that. Just the two of you, God and his son, sitting there over coffee as friends, sharing the deepest thoughts of your heart. See, a man with, with that kind of real personal relationship with God will learn that his walk with God allows for a pouring out that he needs to be poured out. I'm talking about pouring out things that we need to get rid of, guys. Like the need to empty out our anger, the need to empty out our pride or our lust or anything else eating at us. And see, <laughs> this may not have happened in the natural, but our spiritual father, 
he doesn't perceive this as if you're like flinging stuff in his face or that you're blaming God or putting God at fault for these things or that your failures have made it impossible to be upfront and honest with him. Actually, if you do this, it's, it's teaching us and we're learning on how to cast all our care upon him that we have no worries, no concerns, no anxieties. We're learning to follow Scripture. 1 Peter 5, 7 said, do this. And guys, that's what we are to learn to do. See, there's a big difference between simply receiving salvation, as great as that is. Like I talked about that last week, you know, by grace through faith. It's nothing we can do. The Scriptures talk about this multiple times. It's a free gift. So that's an incredible thing. You don't do anything, you receive it. But there's a big difference between that and walking out your salvation with fear and trembling in friendship with the Creator. Now, now I grant it, if hearing that, you may go, that's kind of an oxymoronic statement. Because you just said, Adam, things like fear, trembling, and friendship to equate to God and hanging out with Him. Those things seem like the opposite end of the spectrum. Fear and trembling and friendship? But see... Guys, and this is for everybody, when you have that kind of relationship with God, God becomes included in everything in your life, not just when you need Him when times get tough. This kind of face-to-face -face relationship is what is at the center of Christ's heart for us. I'm reminded of when Jesus, after walking with His disciples for, you know, it's near the end now, three and a half years, they're at the Last Supper, basically, and Jesus says this to them in John he says, no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends, dads. This is the kind of relationship Jesus wants each of us to have with him. If you don't have that with him first, how are you going to have it with your kids? You're going to try to do it like that, but if you don't really have it, you're not going to do it very well. Many of us through the years have asked well, what is this secret to, like, a successful marriage or to, to be a successful parent? The secret has always rested in two sets of hands. First and foremost, in the hand of God. Secondly, in those representing God here. These are our hands, us fathers and us mothers. If we allow those hands to be linked with God, the results are incredible. Lives are changed. Lives are improved. Families are healed. If we lead godly lives, then the odds are that our children will lead godly lives. Remember that God is always, He's always, let me say it again, He's always available for us. And us fathers need to acknowledge that we don't do very well on that one. Hmm. Here's a story about what I mean. There was this man who was putting in a lot of hours, been doing this for years, all for the betterment of his family. So he's coming home again late one night, and his five-year-old son is waiting for him. And he comes through the door, and his, da his son goes, Daddy, Daddy, can I ask you a question? And the father's like, you know, he's tired, but he's like, yes, yeah, son, you sure, go ahead. Daddy, how much do you make an hour? Father kind of got a little ticked off at that. He goes, you don't need to be worrying about that, son. No, Daddy, please, can you just tell me how much do you make an hour? The dad wants to just rest, you know, so just have a moment by himself. So he goes, okay, son, I'll tell you, I make $20 an hour. Son kind of gets a little, you know, down and out. He bows his head and he's like, Dad, can, can I have $10, please? The father, hearing this, gets kind of ticked off. And he starts chewing out the son, giving him a lecture like, you know, you don't need $10. What are you going to do with the $10? You're going to go buy a toy for yourself? You're just going to not like it in a couple of days? You know what? Why don't you just go to bed without supper right now and close the door? So the little boy marches upstairs, gets in his room, and closes the door. Well, the father is still a little irritated, kind of sits down and starts to think, oh, gosh, that wasn't fair. I'm not upset with him. So he's sitting there, and within the next 30 minutes or so, he 
realizes he needs to go upstairs and apologize to his son. So he goes up, goes in the room. He goes, son, are you asleep yet? And he goes, no, daddy, I'm not asleep. He goes, son, listen. Turns on the light. He goes, I'm so sorry. That was wrong of me. You didn't. I was, Dad wasn't mad at you. I'm, I'm sorry. Here's this $10 that you asked for. And the little boy kind of gets up in his bed now, and he, he goes, thanks, Daddy. And he moves his pillow, and he's got this wad of money under his pillow. And the father, seeing this, is kind of like all this crumpled money, and the dad's like, what did you need the $10 for if you did this? He's, and, and the little boy's counting his money. He's counting. He goes, oh, Dad, Dad. I, I, and, and the father's angry again. Tell me what. He goes, Dad, Dad, Dad. Um, I needed the money. I didn't have enough before, but now I do. Dad, I was just wondering if I, I have $20 now. Can I borrow an hour of your time? Mm. Being available is very likely the greatest thing a father can do ever for our kids. That's a big one for us fathers. But there's other stuff we can work on. I'll admit that there are other times when us men don't mean what we say. On a little lighter note, this is for you ladies. Let me allow, allow myself to translate for you ladies a couple of things. When a man says it would take too long to explain that generally means, I have no idea how it works. <laughs> when a man says, take a break, honey, you're working too hard, that really means, can you please stop vacuuming? I want to watch the game. <laughs> when a man says, I heard you, dear, that normally means, I haven't the foggiest clue of what you just said, and I'm hoping desperately, I mean desperately, that I can fake it well enough so that you will not spend the next three days telling me how I never listened to you. When a guy says, that's not what I meant, <laughs> he means, if something I just said can be interpreted two ways, and the one way makes you really upset, please interpret it the other way. And lastly, when a guy says, I know where I'm going, he means, please, honey, don't embarrass me in front of the kids because I'm lost and too prideful to ask for help. It sounds like I was speaking truth, right, ladies? <laughs> and there's more. Scripture gives guidance concerning children and parents. For instance, in Ephesians chapter 6, starting with verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now someone once said, a boy loves his mother but will follow his father. Parenting, it's never easy. It's not easy being a father. It's not easy being a mother. It has incredible challenges, incredible pains, but also incredible joys. We've talked about this a lot today. Yes, God loves his children. And as fathers, as grandfathers, we should also portray this complete love to our children and to our grandchildren. God the Father loves his kids, and he's also quick to encourage his children. That's another lesson, at least for me, that I learned the, learned the hard way. As a father, you want the best for your children. You want them to succeed. You want them to succeed at everything. You really do. Here's something that you need to understand. If you have more than one child, they're all different. They all need encouragement. Some of them need it a little more than others. And us fathers need to grasp this. We need to be the very source of their encouragement. Our God speaks of encouragement through the scriptures all over the place. 
I hope we're grasping that the best thing that we can do for our children is for each of us to personally be right with the Father and to walk in the way that He tells us to walk. To never settle, to not be satisfied with our walk, but to continually seek to be transformed, to be in the likeness of Christ. To finish this, well, marathon. We're running a marathon. We're running this race of life. And to finish it strong. To give our all when we cross over the finish line. And we get to that other side of eternity. Knowing we've had no more to give, and then we'll hear, we're hoping to hear, well done and faithful servant. You fought the good fight. Well done. I want to share this parable of three fathers who each felt the soft hand of their child in their own hand and realized the responsibility of teaching that child about God. One father felt the awesome responsibility that was his, so he taught the child about the power and might of God as they're walking down the pathway of life and came to the tall trees in the forest, he pointed to them and he said, God made them and God can cause them to come crashing down anytime he wants. As they're continuing this walk and the sun is blaring on them and it's a hot day and the father goes, God made that sun. And he can cause it to be so hot, so intense, that the plants in the field will wither and die. Again and again, this father was sharing, you know, about the power of the living God and how the child must be obedient to God. Then one day, they came face to face with God, and the child hid behind his father, afraid to even look, refusing to put his own hand in the hand of God. The second father, he also realized the unbelievable responsibility of teaching his child about God. So he hurriedly tried to teach all the important lessons that he knew. As they are looking at the trees, they didn't even really stop and for a moment and gaze at them. He's just pointing at them and they just kept going. They looked at the flowers in the field and they just kind of walked right by him. The father continued to tell story after story, but they were hurried and crammed together. He filled the child full of facts, but he never taught him how to live or how to love God. Finally, one day, it's twilight, and they came face to face with God. But the child only gave God a casual glance and then turned away. The third father felt the touch of a tender, small hand in his palm, and he adjusted his steps to the tiny steps of his child. They walked along, and then they'd stop to look at all of God's beauty and grandeur. They walked in the fields. They'd pick some flowers. They felt the delicate petals. They smelt the beautiful aroma of the flower. They watched a bird flying. They watched another bird build a nest, lay eggs, and hatch. They watched all the beauty of nature while the father told his child story after story of God. And he'd tell him over and over how good God was. Finally, one day in the twilight, they saw the face of God and without hesitation the child placed his hand trustingly in the hand of his heavenly father. I'm going to ask the band to return. Now, I don't know where each of us are at today, but I do know this, that our heavenly father has made the mistakes that we have and all those things that are going on and that he doesn't want us to let those determine that that be the final outcome for us. He wants us to come to Him this morning, regardless of what you've done. <laughs> mistakes you make as parents and mistakes we've made as kids. He just wants us to come back to Him. And He's waiting. He's waiting with open arms and He wants to throw a party. All He's asking is, will you come? Just as you are. You don't have to go and clean yourself up. You don't even have to put in a breath mint. You can just come. Please know this. God is hopeful and he's patient. He's ready to embrace each and every one of us just as we are. 
He's got boundless mercy, unlimited grace, and he's waiting for you. He just says, receive the son, and come on, let's party is what he's saying. It's okay. Don't let the world dictate how you come to the Father. You can come just as you are. Even after you've come the first time. It's okay. Let Him pour out His mercy and grace as you, you and I pour out our souls. We partake in communion. It's in the back. We do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ because He said to do this to remember Him. It's a great vehicle God gave us for daily communion with him because it's a place to remember the sacrifice that was made by Jesus. The altar team will be up here. If you have any requests, please go to them. Don't miss this opportunity to go to the Father today on Father's Day. Give him great honor. Give him great joy because he's waiting for us. Thank you all. Amen.